because of the uh, the stream. Hi everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Rabbi Rafi Spitzer, the rabbi of this congregation, Congregation Agudat Achim. I'd like to say a couple of words, but I'm not going to talk very much. I'm rabbi, so I talk always more than... Okay. The, the Adult Education Committee is a group of dedicated volunteers. We're always looking for more people who might be interested in serving on that committee, who have their finger on the pulse of the, the needs of the community and the national zeitgeist. And last spring, the Adult Education Committee came to me and they said, Rabbi, we know that you really like to have a theme each year because it holds some of the programming together and there are so many things that we could do as adult education events that it's hard to choose and so it's nice to have a theme and they said given all of everything that's been going on with the book bannings and the uh and uh and what can you teach in the schools and uh uh all of the all of this stuff with the importance of education and, uh, and issues of free speech and issues of censorship and who gets to decide what our children learn in schools. They said, book bannings are so antithetical to what, to Jewish, to a culture of Jewish literary heritage and tradition that we would like to dedicate our theme for the whole year to Jewish literary, uh, to Jewish literary culture. And we're calling our theme for this year, people of the books. You know, the Jewish people have often been called people of the book. That is like the book with a capital T, capital B, meaning the Bible. But of course, we're not people of the Bible. That would be a misunderstanding of Judaism. We're people of the library, people of the books, people of so many books, the Talmud, the Midrash, the commentaries. Uh, we are a tradition that is steeped in literary culture, Hebrew literature, Yiddish literature, poetry, uh, uh, piyut, liturgical poems, right? We are so invested in the written word. And when I talk to Professor Burke, about this idea, he said, I, I could do a series on books that changed the world, on the, the way in which literature has the capacity to affect not just hearts and minds, but events, the world stage, the way that, the, that, that, that history turns. Now, Professor Burke is doing this series in four lectures. And in each lecture, he's going to focus on some of the most influential books of the last 150 years. They're not all books. Some of them are essays or pamphlets or letters, but works of literature that affected history. Uh, we gave a list of them on our uh, information. That's part of what got you here. And that won't be an exhaustive list, right? Uh, Professor Burke is going to talk about other works too. But the, but the main events, the big ones, those are on, are on that list. And we're going to see over the course of the four lectures how those books have affected uh, the history of Russia and the Soviet Union tonight history of the United States of America, the history of Zionism and the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And we're going to see that really laid out for us. You don't need me to tell you that Professor Burke's lectures are dynamic and engaging, that they are, uh, that they are exciting and deeply researched and that you will come out not only having learned something new, but also 
have new questions and things to, and things to explore. And I really want you to think, right, this is not just about the books that changed the world. This is a kickoff to a whole series of adult education programs that are about the people of the books, Jewish literary culture. I'll just give two examples of other ones that we're going to be doing this year. I'm going to be teaching a once a month class that treats American, American texts like the poem, The New Colossus, as literature, as Jewish texts. And we're going to be examining them from a Jewish lens. So that's one aspect, that's, that's called the American Scripture Project. And I'm going to be teaching those courses once a month over the course of the next several months. We're going to be bringing in a rabbi who happens to be a member of the blind community and is going to share with us Rabbi Lauren Tuckman, she's going to share with us what it's like to encounter the Jewish literary culture in Braille. Okay? And we're going to be doing some uh, Jewish literary stuff on art. And we're going to be doing, right? There's a lot of programs. Please do keep your uh, ears posted and uh, leaned in to find out what our programs are. And without further ado, I'm going to ask. Uh, Professor Burke to come and share with us the first in a series of four lectures. You do not, you do not want to miss this. This is going to be really, really exciting. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, yes, uh, a reminder that everybody should silence their phones and uh, and that our uh, Professor Burke will speak uh, until around 8:30, 8:40, and then there'll be a short break, and then he's going to do some questions and interactions. Uh, and also uh, that this is being recorded uh, and some people are participating by stream, though it's much better to be here, here in the room. So we're also glad to have you by stream. Uh, and because of that, Professor Burke, who usually walks around a lot, will be more stationary because that's where the camera will be. Uh, so uh, to, uh, to, to know that it will be a little bit slightly different format. Without further ado, uh, Professor Burke, thank you so much for doing this again with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy and healthy new year to all of you. Thank you for coming. For those of you who are on live stream, I thank you. And for our friends on Long Island who are watching, thank you again as well. Now listen to me now carefully, please very carefully. Gird your loins or whatever you have that passes for loins. We are going to have a historical rump now. I begin by talking to you about Russia at the end of the 19th century. The country was a pressure cooker. The peasants wanted land. Conditions for the workers were absolutely terrible. In the early years of the 20th century, a Russian worker worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. Working conditions were terrible, absolutely terrible. It was a high number of workers, densely concentrated. Large numbers of workers in very, very large factories. Small number of factories, but it was not unusual for a factory to have 10,000 workers and factory complexes would have close to 100,000 workers. That's important. And then, of course, there was the middle class. As the night follows the day, wherever it is in Western Europe and to a certain extent in other parts of the world, a middle class always wants a certain number of things. The right to participate in the political process, a constitution and a parliament. None of those things existed in Russia. That is, up until 1905, when Tsar Nicholas II, in the aftermath of the 1905 revolution, made the concession of creating the Duma, the Russian parliament, there was no parliamentary system. And when he created the Duma, it was really a pseudo-parliamentary system. He retained full control. Now, it was inevitable that in this situation, revolutionary ideas would come into Russia. One of those ideas was Marxism. 
You cannot understand the end of the 19th century and a good part of our century without understanding the appeal and the fear of communism, and certainly it all begins with Marxism. The question among the Marxists in Russia, the question was, how do we get the workers to, in fact, make the revolution? Traditional Marxist ideology, beginning with the Communist Manifesto, with Marx and Engels in the 1840s, argued the proposition that capitalism would implode, socialism would come about, not because capitalism was evil and socialism was good, but the laws of history, the dialectic, would be leading inexorably to the creation of a socialist society. But what was going to move the workers? The theory was the workers striking, getting their heads bashed in by the Cossacks, would eventually learn that the only way was revolution. For those of you, and you date yourselves, I remember I started teaching at Union in 1967. One of the standard courses, or it was a freshman preceptorial course, and one of the books that we had them read was the Communist Manifesto. Nobody reads the Communist Manifesto anymore. The Cold War, to all intents and purposes, is over. Whatever difficulties we have with Putin, it is not over communist ideology. The last sentence in the Communist Manifesto is, workers of the world unite, but you have nothing for you, have nothing to lose but your chains. In other words, traditional Marxist ideology, adhered to by the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, said the workers will finally understand that they have nothing, nothing, in order for them to have a better life, they had to make revolution. That was the theory in the 1890s. The problem with the theory was it wasn't working. The workers were not calling for revolution. The workers wanted higher wages, paid vacations, and better working conditions. That's not socialism. That's not a socialist revolution. And for those in the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, this was something that had to be done away with. That is, these men and women, particularly the men, believed that they knew better than the Russian workers what was best for them. Not really higher wages, paid vacations, and all that kind of stuff. What was really necessary was a revolution. Enter Vladimir Lenin. Real name, Ulyanov. This is a man, of course, born really in, the 18, in 1870. This is a man who really comes from a privileged background. Here I give you a, I move to the side and tell you, nearly all of the great revolutionaries in Europe were not poor boys. They all came from privileged groups. Lenin's father was a school principal. And by virtue of being a school principal, he had, in fact, attained through the civil service corps a minor status of the nobility. So this is not a poor boy that we were talking about. But he's bright, he's smart, and he's got something else. He's got a brother. And the brother is a revolutionary. The brother belongs to another revolutionary party, Narodnia Volya, the people's will. And Narodnia Volya believed in terror. Propaganda by the deed, it said. How are we going to get the Tsarist government to make concessions? You've got to assassinate them. And so the brother tried, together with the group, tried to assassinate Alexander III. And it didn't work out very well. The assassination did not take place. And Lenin's older brother was executed. And here, my friends from the Soviet Union in the back, I don't know if you read about this, but there is a story, of course. It is, if you believe this, you'll believe anything. Lenin was 16 years old at the time when the news comes to the family that his brother has been hanged. And when the news comes, somebody, a messenger comes into the house. Lenin supposedly runs over to his mother and says, Mama! We will do it a different way. That is, by that, no terror. Not because terror is immoral, but terror will get you nowhere. The only way that you can get success is through mass revolution. So Lenin now looks at the situation, the late 1890s, 1900, 1901, 1902. And he looks at the Russian workers and says, 
something is wrong, they will never make revolution. So in 1902, he publishes a book. In Russian, the book is Shtodyalat. What is to be done? What are we to do? And Lenin is now going to turn Marxism on its head. Lenin, the most famous book, sentence in what is to be done, in English it is the work, quote, the workers, if left to themselves, will never develop anything more than a trade union consciousness, end quote. That is, if you wait for the workers to make revolution, it'll be a lot of Shavuos's that will pass. They will not make the revolution. You can't leave the revolution to the workers. What Lenin says is that there has to be something to prod the workers into revolution. There has to be someone to lead the workers into the revolution. Lenin's contribution is the role of the party, or, my Russian friends will correct my pronunciation, the party is the Rukovodito. The party is the avant-garde of the proletariat. The party will lead the workers into the revolution. Without that party, there is no revolution. And then Lenin says, if the party is important, this has got to be a special type of party. You can't have a party, a Marxist party, like they have in, in England and France and in Belgium and the Netherlands and in Italy. Remember, if you remember this from high school and college history classes, the generic term for a Marxist party is the Social Democratic Party, social democracy, indicating that a Marxist party is not only socialist, but it's democratic. So how does a decision be made in France? You have a meeting, a public meeting, you have a vote, and decisions are made. And Lenin says, that's loony, these are not his words now, that's loony tunes. It won't work in Russia. Russia is an autocracy. There is a very effective Russian secret police. In Russian, it's the Okhrana. Very, very effective. It has spies everywhere. It even has spies in New York City. To give you an idea of how effective this government is, the greatest pogrom in the modern period before World War I was the Kishinev pogrom in April of 1903. In my own research, I have seen a letter from a Russian secret agent in New York City sending a check for $500 to a newspaper in Texas, in Amarillo, Texas, asking them to make an editorial favorable to the Tsarist government in the aftermath of the condition of pogrom. I only mention that to you because Lenin is now saying, we can't do it the way they do it there. We have to have a tight, conspiratorial, professional party. We can't have dilettantes in the party. We can't have people who are doctors and engineers spend most of their time in their professions and then once a week or once a month they go to a socialist party meeting. No. Lenin says we have to have professional revolutionaries, men and women who will dedicate their entire lives to the revolutionary movement. And this nonsense about having elections in a party congress with the Okhrana and its agents all around, no. What we have to have is an institution within the party known as the Central Committee. The Central Committee will debate issues, 12, 15 men. They will debate the issues, they will come to a decision, and all decisions made by the Central Committee will be binding on lower party cells. The English translation of what this is, this is known as democratic centralism. This is not democracy. So we have a tight conspiratorial party. These issues, remember the party has to meet in exile in London and in Brussels. At the Second Party Congress, Lenin's ideas come up for a vote. We're on a tight conspiratorial party, democratic centralism. The, part, the issues are raised on the table. There's considerable debate, considerable debate. One of the parties there, it's one of the largest of the Marxist party, is a party that some of our relatives belong to a long time ago. We all have pink or red skeletons in our closet. We don't like to talk about it, but it's there. The organization that I'm talking about, Soviet historians never paid attention to it because they didn't want to say anything good about the Jews, 
was this was the Jewish Workers Bund. The Bund was a very large party with large numbers of Jews in it. And at that second party Congress, the Bund says to the party Congress, we want to have the right autonomy. We want the exclusive right to represent the Jewish workers. There should be a separate Jewish section of the Communist Party. And everybody, including many Jews, said no. We want one highly centralized party. And the Bund walked out. The Bund walks out. That leaves a truncated group of people. And then Lenin's, Lenin's positions or policies come up for a vote. When the Bund pulls out, Lenin's party or Lenin's faction is the majority faction. The word for majority in Russian is Bolshinstvo. One who votes in the, in the majority is a Bolshevik. The minority, the Russian word for minority is Menshinstvo. One who votes in the minority is a Menshevik. Lenin is now in control of a good part of the party, although out in the boonies, in Siberia, in the Urals, and even within Russia, probably European Russia, there are more Mensheviks than Bolsheviks. But very, very cleverly, Lenin takes the name Bolshevik. And this is a party, a highly centralized party, his faction highly centralized. This is the man that calls the shots. He dominates the Central Committee. And then if I haven't lost you already, we now come to something else, another man. This man, a Jew. Remember, these people are hiding from the Okhrana. They all have pseudonyms. Lenin's real name is Ulyanov. At that Second Party Congress, another man rises to the fore. He, here's the irony, this is a man that later Lenin will link himself to, but not in 1903. I know where I'm standing, so I have to watch my language. This guy, well, he has the proper genitalia. Let me put it to you that way. He's as smart as Lenin, and he is as sharp as Lenin, and he's as good an orator as Lenin. He too has a synonym, a synonym, a pseudonym. This is Leon Trotsky, whose real name is Bronstein. And Trotsky in 1903 is going to make one of the great prophecies of the 20th century. He stands up, confronts Lenin, and he says to the party, if Comrade Lenin has his way, the party will replace the, the, the movement. The Central Committee will replace the party and the dictator will replace the Central Committee. He's right. He has seen the authoritarian tendency in Lenin's ideas, but no matter, no matter, Lenin's faction is now the Bolshevik faction in the party. And then just before, several years before World War I, Trotsky would oppose Lenin, has come up with a new idea. Again, I don't want to lose you on this. Traditional or conventional Marxism had said, before you get the socialist revolution, you have to have a capitalist revolution. A capitalist revolution will develop the productive resources of society. It will create a huge proletariat. And that proletariat, because of the internal laws of contradiction, will become larger and larger, poorer and poorer, until it is ready to make revolution. Well, Lenin already dispensed with that. The workers will not make revolution by themselves. And now Trotsky says, of oh, this is the idea, for those who want proper nouns, this is the idea of permanent revolution. Trotsky argues that in Russia, the bourgeoisie of the middle class is too weak to make a capitalist revolution. And the middle class people and the well-to-do people, they're chicken, they're cowards. They will not challenge the Tsar. Therefore, the workers will make the revolution, the proletariat. They will overthrow the Tsar and go right to socialism. The revolution becomes permanent, doesn't change. And then it says something else. The revolution in Russia will spread to the rest of the world. Again, the revolution is permanent. Permanent in the sense it goes through one process right to the other, one country right to the other. Lenin buys into that. Lenin now believes the workers can make the revolution, the party can lead the workers into the revolution. Lenin never thought he would see 
the day that the revolution would come. But Lenin could not foresee, at least not in the future, short future, he could not see World War I. I teach a course on World War I at Union now, and I tell the students on the first day of that class, World War I is the seminal event of the 20th century. Lenin's accession to power in October of 1917 is due to World War I. Mussolini's accession to power in Italy in 1922 is a consequence of World War I. And anybody who had a good high school or college history class knows that on January 30th of 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power, and that too is a consequence of World War I. But we are concerned with Lenin. Lenin thinks it's not maybe not in his lifetime, but the war comes, and the war is going to destroy, overthrow the Romanov dynasty. The situation is too bad. The Russians are going from defeat to defeat. They are incompetent. Russian generals commit suicide because of their incompetence. The problem with any authoritarian government is that high-ranking officials, including generals in the army, are promoted on the basis of loyalty, not on the basis of competence. And the Russian high command is led by dummies. I'm not being condescending here. These are men that simply are promoted on the basis of their, some of them have blood linkages to the Tsar himself, and some of them are really great loyalists. They are no match for the German army. The German army outnumbered, defeats them at the Battle of Tannenberg in the late summer of 1914, and the Germans keep rolling along. They're not far from Petrograd. Again, more history than you ever wanted to know. In a burst of enthusiasm and, and patriotism, the city of St. Petersburg sounds to be too German, and the name is to changed to Petrograd. Petrograd, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, St. Petersburg again, they're all the same city. Now, what's going to happen now is, of course, comes the end of February 1917. It is a classic development that takes place. It's International Women's Day. That's an international holiday commemorated by the socialist movement. Even in America, some people remember International Women's Day. The women from the factories in Petrograd go out. The police do their usual stuff, beating the living daylights out of the women. The men come out of the factories to support the women. The Cossacks come out, and for the first time in Russian history, the Cossacks do not open fire on the crowd. They do what Trotsky said, or what he said he described. He called it, in English, the expression would be the melting process. The Cossacks melt into the crowd, turn their weapons over to the strikers, and in 48 hours, the February Revolution has come. And the Tsarist government, which had come to power, the Romanov dynasty, in 1613, had experienced innumerable crises. In 48 hours, it disappears into what Trotsky called the garbage can of history. Now, to show you again, they used to, the first leading Russian specialist in the United States was a refugee from Russia. He was a man by, he taught at Harvard, a man named Michael Karpovich. And Karpovich used to deliver a lecture, not only to the Russian students, to the students of Russian history, but to all students at Harvard. It was a first year lecture. And the lecture used to be entitled, How I Slept Through the February Revolution. He was a student at the university in Petrograd. Like many students, he was drunk. And he just slept for 24, 48 hours. And when he got up, they told him the Tsarist government was no more. This is Lenin's opportunity. Lenin now sees the opportunity. With the passage of time, Russia continues its experience in the war. The war goes from bad to worse. The Germans keep advancing. And Lenin, who is in exile, now comes back. Comes back to Russia from London, from Switzerland. Remember, some of you may know this from history class. He comes back on the famous sealed train. Lenin had said, this is an imperialist war. Nobody listened to him. Lenin had said, this is an imperialist war. The capitalists of one country are fighting the capitalists of another country for colonies. Why should the workers of one country go into the trenches and kill the workers of another country? Lenin's famous expression, nobody pays attention in 1914. His address to the Russian workers was, turn the imperialist war into a class war. To the Russian soldiers in the trenches, he says, take your rifles, take your bayonets, 
Leave the trenches. Go back to Petrograd and Moscow and shove your bayonets into the fat bellies of the capitalist class. Turn the imperialist war or the imperial, the imperial war into a class revolution. Nobody listens in 1914. The rest of the socialist movement, they are overwhelmed by patriotism and nationalism. They fight. So do the German workers who said before the war, we will not vote for war credits. Germany enters the war because they vote for war credits. No ideology in modern history is more powerful than nationalism. The socialist movement in Russia succumbs to nationalism. But by 1917, the losses are great. Russia loses two and a half million men that we know of in World War I. Millions are wounded. There are shortages of everything. Skyrocketing prices, skyrocketing inflation. Lenin arrives back in April of 1917 at what came to be known as the Finland Station. And again, you can correct my pronunciation. What does he say in Russian? Vsyavlast Sovietum. All power to the Soviets. Lenin is carrying out Trotsky's idea. We're not going to wait for a capitalist revolution. The provisional government that worse the Tsar, that followed the Tsar, that's a capitalist government. Lenin says there's a new Soviet government, an unofficial government. They should take power. And in October of 1917, Lenin takes power. This is a good example of what personality means in history, what ideology means in history, and I must tell you, it's not the first time and not the last time that a relatively small group of people of all the revolutionary parties in Russia in February of 1917, in a country of over 100 million people, there were no more than 40,000 Bolsheviks. No one in a million years would have bet that the Bolshevik party would come to power. The PSR, the Socialist Revolutionary Party, was much larger. There were more Mensheviks. They were even more anarchists than they were in the Bolsheviks. But it's the Bolsheviks who come to power. They gain support because the situation is bad, and they win because they are well-led. Lenin is a politically astute person. He knows which way the wind is going. He knows what his people want, and he has a highly disciplined, highly motivated party. It's not the first time in history, it's not the last time in history that people who are in the minority but well-led, well-disciplined, highly motivated, can turn history around. In fact, demonstrating that it's a minority party, Lenin comes to power in October of 1917. He's got a problem, a very serious problem. The problem is that the provisional government, led by a man by the name of Alexander Kerensky, had promised finally that we will eventually have elections for all people. Everybody's going to be able to vote. And we're going to have what is called the Constituent Assembly. We're going to have elections in November and December. The Constituent Assembly is going to meet in January. And they will decide whether we stay in the war, agrarian reform, working class reform, the nationalities, boom, boom, boom. Lenin's problem is, should I allow the elections to take place? There are people in the Central Committee who say, no, don't do it. The Constitutional Assembly will be a competing, a competing government to us. Don't do it. But Lenin says, we're going to do it. We'll take our chances, and if things don't work out, we'll make sure that they work out. Sure enough, in the elections that are held, the Bolsheviks do well, but they get less than 25% of the vote. 75% of the vote is for the non-Bolshevik parties. So the Constituent Assembly meets. As I tell my students, because I like to rub it in. Whatever you think about Lenin, he was not a Union College wimp. That is for sure. The Constituent Assembly meets. It has a president, a man by the name of Viktor Chernov, a good and decent man, the leader of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. He is elected to be the chairman of the Constituent Assembly. First day they meet, they begin to pass legislation. Lenin sees the threat, and he sends in the shock troops of the Russian Bolshevik Party. These are the sailors from Kronstadt. Kronstadt is a naval base not far from Petrograd. They come in with their rifles and their bayonets, and one of them says to Chernov, Comrade Chernov, the meeting is over. 
And Chernoff says, what do you mean? And he takes his bayonet, puts it close to Chernoff's neck and says, comrade, I told you the meeting is over. And so it was. And once again, Trotsky says, using that expression, the Constituent Assembly has disappeared into the trash bin or the garbage can of history. Lenin is now in power. And he will be in power for quite some time. But what he has established is a principle for other revolutionary parties, other parties that call themselves communist, highly centralized, strong leadership, decisive training and discipline and motivation, and a willingness to take power, whatever the risks are. That's Lenin's contribution without Lenin, even Trotsky. Now he's, he's close to Lenin, but even Trotsky, remember he's a Marxist. And a Marxist, a good Marxist, downplays the role of personality in history. It's classes, economics, that's what makes history go. And in his great work about the Russian Revolution, Trotsky gets right to the point. Without Lenin, there is no Bolshevik Revolution. It is as simple as that. All right. That's the situation that will exist right down until, well, till Gorbachev in the 1980s, but until the Soviet Union implodes in 1991. So Lenin's What is to be Done is a very, very important book. That's the book that helped create the Soviet Union. Now I'm going to talk to you about a book that put nails in the coffin of the Soviet Union. That's Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. Gulag is an acronym for the state, labor camps, and so on. We are now really in the 1930s. Stalin has long, Solzhenitsyn comes later, but I'm setting the background for you. In the ninth, beginning in 1929, Stalin launched a three-pronged revolution upon the Russian people, going further than Lenin had ever done. Item number one, the collectivization of Soviet agriculture. It will take five million lives to collectivize Soviet agriculture, to take 15 million independent peasant holdings and turn them into 160,000 collector farms, the Chokhoz, that's what he's doing. Five million people will die in period, the period of collectivization. The second part of the revolution is the industrialization of Russia, the two five-year plans. Now, there is a linkage between the two, but we don't have time because we've got to finish before Shavuos, so I won't tell you the linkage. The third part of the revolution, the Stalin revolution, is the purge. Here we are in a quandary. 1936 to 1939, Millions of Soviet citizens, some of the best and the brightest, are going to be chewed up in the purge. At least one million dead, at least one million dead, and then millions more are sent to the Gulag. It is a terrible, terrible situation, a very, very bad time. It is also very consequential. You want to hear a stunning figure? When the Soviet Union enters World War II, close to 40% of all officers in the Red Army are purged. The highest rank in the Red Army is a marshal of the Red Army, a marshal of the Soviet Union. There were six marshals of the, so of, the, of the Soviet Union. Four of them are executed before the Second World War. For those of you who are familiar with the history of the Second World War, the Red Army goes not from defeat to defeat, but from catastrophe to catastrophe. The best and the brightest they're dead, or they're rotting in Siberia. What's the old joke? They all, one of the old jokes, the beginning of the 1930s. What's the tallest building in Moscow? Well, there are many tall buildings in Moscow, but there's one in particular. It's not the tallest, it's the Lubyanka. That's the great NKVD prison. You know what the joke is? You know why it's the tallest building in Siberia, and then uh, the tallest building in Moscow? Because from the basement, you can see Siberia because that's where they send them. That's if they're lucky. Many of them are tortured terribly, teeth knocked out and executed in the Lubyanka. So this is the purge. We're not sure of why he implemented the purge. We're not sure. His daughter Svetlana Alalueva, who came to our country as a defector, said that a father was as loony as a fruitcake. That by the end of the 1930s, he was 
Again, historians never use these medical terms. He was paranoid, she said, that he was manipulated by people like Beria and others for their own advantage. Maybe, maybe. No psychiatrist ever put him on the couch. There were other reasons for it. Did he suspect treason and opposition everywhere? Don't know. He did. Was there any real opposition? The answer is no. There was no viable opposition to Stalin, either within the party or outside of the party. Does he feel German agents, Japanese agents? There's no evidence that that was the case. So why did he do it? We don't know. In fact, I must tell you, the first time I went to the Soviet Union in 1969, you walked through the streets of what at that time was called Leningrad and Moscow, you saw plaques on buildings. Here lived so-and-so from 1928 to 1938 until he or she disappeared in the cult of personality. That was the official Soviet term, beginning with Khrushchev, the cult of personality. The official Soviet view was that the purges had nothing to do with communism, nothing to do with Marxism-Leninism, it all had to do with that SOB Joseph Stalin. If Stalin were not there, the system would have worked very, very well. This is the background for Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was an artillery officer in the Red Army. In 1945, he made the mistake of writing a letter to a friend, another officer in the Red Army in another unit. In that letter, he made a derogatory remark about Stalin. He should have known what he was doing. Just to today, as I tell my students, be very careful what you put on an email. Nothing. Do you know that Union College has, has accessibility to all of my emails? They have the computer. It's their computer. They can open it up. So I tell them, don't put anything on the computer. Talk to people on the telephone. You can always deny what you said. With an email, you cannot deny it. So somebody opens up the letter. He is arrested and is sentenced to eight years in the Gulag. From 1945 to 1983, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is in the Gulag. It was, I'll tell you, it's a terrible experience. We'll get into that. He is let out in 1953 after Stalin died. This is the period in Russian or Soviet history known as the Thaw. Stalin is dead. People are jockeying for power. If you want to see something that is tragicomical, you can see it on Netflix, The Death of Stalin. It is really almost hysterical. It is very, very funny. As these guys, they don't know what they're doing. Stalin is dead. They don't, first of all, they don't think he's dead. They worry, they, they stay around the corpse. They know he's gonna rise. Somehow he's gonna get up and he's gonna kill us all. But of course, he's dead. But the mystery around his death is such that to this day, there are people who say he really did not die of a stroke, that he was poisoned by these people that is close to him because he was, this we know for sure. There's no evidence that he was poisoned. But what we do know for sure from Khrushchev's memoirs, that had Stalin not died, there would be another purge and that all of those people, Khrushchev, Malenkov, Beria, Molotov, they all would have been purged. So there was a motive for poisoning, but there was no evidence that he was poisoned. So Janisin comes out. He teaches mathematics in the Ural Mountains and he begins to think about his experience. Khrushchev comes to power, 1955, and Khrushchev begins to open up. It is under Khrushchev that close to five million prisoners from the Gulag are released. Why does Khrushchev lighten things up to a certain extent? That's always a mystery. I must tell you, this no one would deny, even his best biographer, Philip Taubman, would not deny this, Khrushchev was a hatchet man. Now, for my friends in the back, a hatchet man is a killer, working for, as an accomplice. He was a hatchet man. He played a role in killing probably hundreds of thousands of people in the Ukraine in the 1930s. He did everything that Stalin told him to do, including putting on lists some of his closest friends. When Taubman interviewed Khrushchev, who was dead already, when Kao Taubman interviewed Khrushchev's wife, and his children and his relatives, they all made the incredible point. He felt terribly guilty, terribly, terribly guilty about what he had done. And he understood that the Soviet Union was in a straitjacket. Things had to lighten up. And so he lightens up. People come out of the, out of the gulag. 
there's a certain amount of freedom, in, not real freedom, but people are allowed to write things. And that's when Solzhenitsyn becomes a famous man. He writes a manuscript. He wants the Russian people to know what went on in the Gulag. And he, sub he submits a manuscript to the leading Soviet literary journal. That is Novi Mir, New World. It had a reputation for being not a renegade, but more liberal than others. And Khrushchev allows it to be published. That's one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. That's, the, that's a bombshell. When he talks about how people worked 50 degrees below zero, 60 degrees below zero, in the mines, dying all the time, prostitution of women, absolute brutality. The Russian people did not know that. They may have thought that, they may have made stories from relatives, but the fact of the matter is, this is a bombshell. And Khrushchev allows that book to be published. But Khrushchev was removed from power in 1964. Number of reasons for that. One, Khrushchev was almost putting Russia in an undeclared war with communist China. That was one thing. And then, as we all know, I tell my students, I'm not a political scientist, style is very, very important in history and in politics. You don't want to look like a klutz. You don't want to look like a dummy. Or the Italians have an expression, you don't want to look like a cavone. Or the Russians say, you don't want to look like a mujik. And here's this man at the United Nations. He likes, he doesn't like a speech made by another delegate. He takes off his shoe and boom, he pounds it on the desk. You know what the Yiddish expression would be? Es passt nicht. It doesn't look very, very nice. But what really does him in is the mistake he makes over Cuba. Remember 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis? For those of you who are old enough, it was a very, we went on the highest alert that we have ever been in terms of a nuclear alert. I was a student at the University of Chicago at the time, and the Chicago Tribune had an editorial, Soviet missiles aimed at Chicago. People were frightened. We almost came to the brink of war. It was only very cleverly done by President Kennedy and his brother Bobby Kennedy that we did not get into the war. There were men in our high command, like Curtis LeMay, who said, nuke them, just bomb Cuba. And if any ship comes by, sink the ships. Well, they worked out a face-saving device in which Khrushchev backed down, but so did we back down. We hailed this as a great victory, but Khrushchev got something from us. And what he got from us was a promise not to invade Cuba. Because remember, in 1961, we invaded or helped invade Cuba through the Bay of Pigs. He got a promise. He elicited from Kennedy, we would not inv invade Cuba, and that promise continues down to the present day. The other thing he got from Kennedy was he got the United States to put out, pull away its nuclear missiles from Turkey. These were important. The American people were not told that at the time. We held this as a great victory. But in the Soviet Union, it didn't look good. It didn't look good. We were almost at the brink of war, and the Americans have more intercontinental ballistic missiles. They have more B-52s than we have. And finally, there was something else. Khrushchev was warned, Comrade Khrushchev, don't get into this stuff about attacking Stalin. In February 1956, in a famous de-Stalinization speech, Stalin blasted Stalin up one wall and down the other. Khrushchev blasted Stalin up one wall and down the other. And he accused some of his competitors for power of participating with Stalin. He said, no good. Some people in the party said, Listen, Comrade Khrushchev, the day will come when you will be brought to account. And that day came in another party congress. Now, a party congress in the Soviet Union is like a Ruth Westheimer lecture. I'm serious. Those who have attended a lecture here know, yeah, I hope you all know who Ruth Westheimer is. If you don't, you can learn a lot about sex from a 96-year-old woman. Very, very impressive, I must tell you. She comes in wherever she is. I heard her not in this synagogue, but in another synagogue. And what usually happens is index cards are handed out to people. The index card, people write your questions down and the rabbi or someone else uh, reads the question, really screening out 
questions that really are not prudent to use from the Beamer. So that's a Communist Party Congress. Index cards were handed out, and they're all brought to Khrushchev. He looks through, answers some of the questions, and then he says, comrades, I have been attending party congresses from the early 1920s. This is the best question that has ever been asked by anyone at a party congress. And he reads, he reads the question out loud. And someone had actually written, Comrade Khrushchev, you have told us all about the terrible things that Stalin did. Where were you, Comrade Khrushchev, when all of this was happening? And Khrushchev, who may have been a Muzhik, was a clever man. You know what he said? Comrade, the best question that I have ever heard in 40 years is the best question. Will the comrade who asked that question please stand up? 1,400 delegates, no one stood up. And then Khrushchev said, now you understood. Now you understand what it was under Stalin. But he'd gone too far because people were questioning the Communist Party leadership. Molotov, Kaganovich, Malyengo, all these people. Where were you when all of this took place? These are the reasons that Khrushchev is not there after 1964. The years go by and this man, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, teaching math, is now pondering about his experience. And what he does is he remembers, he had almost a, a photographic memory. He remembers the conversations that he had with people in the Gulag. And now under Khrushchev, many of these people are out, he goes to see them, interviews them, and then he writes the book, The Gulag Archipelago. This book is going to appear in 1973. It's not published in Russia. In Russia, what takes place is what in Russian is called samizdat, self-publication. You write it on your typewriter, and then you hand it from hand to hand. I must tell you, in the 70s, there were copying machines in the Soviet Union. Every copying machine in the Soviet Union had to be registered with the local party cell. You can't do, I tell the students, what you take for granted here. You got a paper, I tell them, Xerox the paper. You can't do that. So it's got to be, you type it out on your typewriter and you hand it to person, to person, to person. In 1974, it's smuggled out and it's published in a foreign country. All right. Now, what does he say here? What does Solzhenitsyn say in the Gulag Archipelago? He First of all, he describes what happens. He says, and he re he's responding to, not responding, he's referring to one of the great Russian playwrights at the end of the 19th century, Anton Chekhov. And he says, if Chekhov's people and characters, if they were told this is what would happen 40 years later, they would never have believed it. In fact, if they said this is what happened, they'd be put in a mental institution. He talks about how in the gulag, they crush men's testicles. That's what they did. They took an iron brand and shoved it up the anus of men and women. They branded people. They threw them into acidic baths. It was terrible. Absolutely terrible, he said. And then some of these guys and women who were in the gulag in the 30s and in the 40s, now they were old, they had survived somehow, but they had been revolutionaries under the Tsar and they had been imprisoned by the Tsarist government. And the conditions, here's what shocked people, the conditions in a Tsarist prison were much better than the conditions in a Soviet prison. A political prison in the Tsarist, in the Tsarist prison, before World War I, if it's a political prison, not a criminal, not a rapist, not a thief, but a political prisoner had right of access to the prison library. He could write things, he could get packages, not in a Soviet prison. So the terrible conditions, one, and of course the comparison, the analogy with what the situation was in Tsarist prisons. And then he went right for the jugular. Why did this happen? How did it come to be that we lived in a country that was so repressive? And remember, now he is attacking the official Soviet position. Remember I told you about 10 minutes ago, the official Soviet position was, it has nothing to do with Lenin, nothing to do with Marxism, Leninism, it has to do with this guy Stalin. He did it all. 
If he were not there, the system would be working very, very well. And what does Solzhenitsyn say? Nonsense. Nonsense. He attacks the Holy of Holies. There's even a holier than the Holy of Holies that we'll come to in about a minute. He says, you know where the Gulag began? And he's right. It didn't begin with Stalin. It began with Lenin and the Red Terror of 1919. It's Lenin that established the Gulag. It's Lenin that killed tens of thousands of people. It's Lenin that really put people north of the Arctic Circle. Not to the same extent that Stalin did. Lenin was talking about tens of thousands, maybe several hundred thousand. Stalin was talking about dealing with the millions. But Lenin began the system. Lenin did it, not Stalin. And then, that's the Holy of Holies. But the holiest of holies is that Solzhenitsyn goes, and this is why they're going to throw him out. He says, you know where it all began? Not with Lenin, but with Karl Marx. It's Marxism, that, that prop, ideological prop upon which the whole system rested, it was corrupt and dictatorial from their work, from the get-go. Why? If you remember in college, you took a good course that dealt with this. Remember, once you overthrow the capitalist class, the next stage, according to Marxist theory in history, is what is called the dictatorship of the proletariat in which the proletariat rules the country and can do anything it wants with those who oppose it. That's the ideology that led us down into this terrible hole that we, in which we are in. Solzhenitsyn puts more than one nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. It really is a turning point. In some ways, I must say, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, this is the most important non-fictional work of the 20th century. This is a book that helped bring down a brutal system. And now it is getting late, and I know that some of you are getting antsy because if I was sitting where you were, I'd be antsy. So my friends, let's take, I beg of you, a five minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago. All right? Five minutes, stretch your legs, we'll come back. Malcolm.
All right, my friends, we should begin in about less than two minutes. All right, my friends, we are going to begin in one minute. I'm sorry, we want to finish fairly early or on time. All right, my friends, we'll lighten us up a little before I get into talking about Dr. Zhivago. Murray Jarris, my good friend Murray, tells me that he was the one, uh, when Ruth Westheimer came, and he was the one that went through the index cards. And he showed a good deal of prudence because there were things that some people thought should not be dealt with from the Bema. When I saw Ruth Westheimer, they didn't hand out index cards. It was a large audience. Most of the people in the audience were women. Very few men. I had never heard Ruth Westheimer before, so I wanted to see it. And it was, it's actually funny. Women would ask her questions in the following manner. My friend has asked me to ask you. <laughs> One right after the other. My friend, I have a friend at home who has asked me to ask you. All right. Solzhenitsyn will be expelled from the Soviet Union in 1973. In 1974, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, a worthy prize and a worthy recipient. I now move to a book that was written earlier. This is a book written in the middle of the 1950s and also surfaced or circulated in the Soviet Union through Samizdat. That is, again, handwritten stuff or the typewriter and you pass it from hand to hand. This is the book by probably the greatest Soviet poet of the 20th century, Boris Pasternak. And the book is, of course, you've seen the film, but the book is a better, it's much better in the book, as is usually the case. That's the book, Dr. Zhivago. Dr. Zhivago is going to get Pasternak in a great deal of trouble because he defied the prevailing policy in art and in literature. That was a policy of what in Russia, in English would be called socialist realism. Socialist realism means that you never, whether it was a painting, a poem, a, a book, you never pointed to the deficiencies in Soviet society. You always made it look very, very good. Now, I'm being a little crude here, and I'm being a little exaggerating. I'm exaggerating to a certain extent. There would be pictures of life on the Cholchos, the collector farm. Boy meets girl on the collector farm, and they both make love to the tractor. The point here in all of this is everything has to look very, very good. Nothing could be said in a disparaging way about workers in factories. This is, these are the chosen people of the revolution. These are the primary beneficiaries of the Soviet system. And here comes Pasternak and writes this novel, partially based on his own life. It begins right at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, and it goes right through the middle of the 1920s. That's essentially what the book is about. And what the book describes is, particularly in the revolution, it tells things about the revolution that people were not accustomed to hearing. Maybe they heard about, maybe they didn't sympathize with it but not with the way, not in the way that Zhivago experiences it and Pasternak writes about it. Zhivago was a physician, solid middle class. He lives in a nice apartment. He goes to work after February of 1917 to work in the clinic and comes back at five o'clock and finds out in his three or four room apartment that there are now four families in the apartment. There's a family, one family in the bedroom, oh, four families in the apartment, and they have established a house Soviet. And they tell him, 
when he can go to the bathroom, when he can use the bathroom, when he can use the, the facilities, when he can use the kitchen, and so on. That's what the revolution is all about. The seizure of private property, a war of the have-nots against the haves, but it's more than that. The symbol of a prosperous middle-class family or middle-class family in the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg, Moscow and Petrograd, was a piano. And what he describes, Pasternak, he describes how when a working class or proletarian family, when they would come in, the class hatred and animosity is so great that they would come into a house with a piano, they would come with a hatchet, not just destroy the piano, and then take the wire, the piano wires, and string up the members of the middle class or the, white, the wealthy family. It was brutal, absolutely brutal, this revolution. This is not what you're supposed to say. You just can't say it. And by the time you get through half of the novel, or once you get through up to the end 1918 and 1919, the reader is forced to say, was the whole damn revolution worth it? Is this what happened here? Millions of dead people, loss of private property, and the irony here is, while all of this is going on in the Soviet Union, while all of this is going on, some Americans on the left think that we are about to witness the creation of a utopian society. The dumbest statement ever made by an American journalist was made by a man that we all learned about in high school, one of the muckrakers, Lincoln Steffens, a good man and a decent man who po pointed out the deficiencies in, a, in an American society, a supporter of immigration, all these, the kind, a good and decent guy. He goes to the Soviet Union and comes back and makes this incredibly stupid statement, so stupid that it should warn people about taking any journalist's word. Be careful. Even in the Holy of Holies, the New York Times, be very, very careful. You know what Stefan said? After returning, this is a time when people are being executed in the streets, where people are starving. Lincoln Stephens comes back and tells, writes, quote, here's the famous remark, quote, I have seen the future and it works, end quote. What a dumb statement. Now, again, Zhivago or Pasternak is saying it just the way it really was. It was a very, very difficult time. And the Red Army and the, what at that time was called the Cheka, that's the Soviet secret police, is going to wreak havoc and keep everybody in line. It had become an authoritarian society with support. I would be lying to you if said there was no support. There were lots of support. And I must tell you, in an embarrassing way, I don't like to talk about this in class, a disproportionate number of the people who supported the Soviet government were Jews. In fact, in 1938, Pravda, in a special issue, commemorated the founding of the Cheka, the Soviet secret police, and published the 200 leading members, and at least 75 to 100 were men and women of Jewish extraction. No surprise here. No surprise here. The Soviet Union looked good for many people, including Jews in our country, lots of people in our country. After all, I must tell you two things and then we'll move on to another book. One is the Soviet government in the 1920s was the only government in the world that made the dissemination of anti-Semitic propaganda a capital offense. You could die for spreading anti-Semitic propaganda. And fair is fair. The Soviet Union, if you were willing, if you were a Jew, and you were willing to, I'll use the colloquial expression, play ball with the Soviet authorities. You divorced yourself from Zionism. You divorced yourself from the religion. Almost everything was open. The Soviet Jewish population never exceeded 3% of the population. By the end of the 1920s, 25% of all students in Soviet universities were Jewish. There were Soviet Jewish submarine commanders, Soviet Jewish generals. At least three of those men who were purged were Jews. Maybe four. Some of the best and the brightest. Which you, everything was open if you were willing to play ball with the Soviet authorities. 
Don't go to the synagogues, intermarry desirably, divorce yourselves from any talk of returning to Palestine. In the 20s, everything was open to you. And that's why large numbers of Jews supported the Soviet Union. In addition to that, Stalin, who by no means, by no stretch of the imagination, could be considered a philo-Semite, he was an anti-Semite, not a philo-Semite, Stalin declares at the end of the 1920s that if a sufficient number of Jews move to a special place on the Amur River in Soviet, Soviet Central Asia, an area that was called Biro Bijan, he would create an autonomous Soviet Jewish Republic. I cannot tell you, again, on the one hand you get Lincoln Steffens saying, again, I've seen the future and it works. Many people believed it. I tell the students, the first day of every history class that I teach, you've got, if you want to understand history, you've got to put yourself back in place and time. The Soviet Union looked awfully good to many people in the 1920s. So good did it look in the 20s and the 30s and 40s that in our country, in England and in France, there were men and women, some of whom were Jewish, they sold out our country. I'm not a supporter of that terrible first Senator McCarthy, but the fact of the matter is, if you see the film Oppenheimer, which you should see, the Soviet Union penetrated into Los Alamos. There were Soviet spies everywhere. And these men and women who spied for the Soviet Union did not do it for money. They did it because they believed that the Soviet Union was the socialist homeland. They didn't understand. It was absolutely incredible. Men and women will sell out their country. The Cambridge Five, remember. In England, people who are highly placed in, in, MI5, in MI6. These people will sell them out. They'll call, they'll, dis, they'll lead to the deaths of all agents, of many agents sent by the British and sent by the United States. And again, they do it not for money. The Soviet Union looked awfully good for a long period of time. One of the few people that saw it for what it was, was a woman the likes of whom they don't make any more. This was what the FBI called, or who the FBI called the most dangerous woman in the world. This was Emma Goldman, a Litvak, a Lithuanian Jew who comes to Rochester, works in the factories, and becomes, to use the old language, a Fabrenta revolutionary. There's even a linkage, never proved, a linkage of her with the assassination of President McKinley. But that has never been proven. When I tell you that they don't make women like this, this is a woman that gets up in a theater in front of everybody and shows women how to use a diaphragm. They don't make them like that anymore. <laughs> now, when the revolution takes place, people on the left send Emma Goldman to Russia. What's doing? They want to find out what's really happening there. And they expect that when she comes back, she's going to write, like Lincoln Steffens wrote, a glowing account. And what does she write? The title of the book is My Disillusionment in Russia. And she lays out some of the things that I've spoken to you about. People on the left say, Emma, we're drinking too much, too much vodka. Go back again and get the story straight this time. She goes back again and writes a second book. And the title of the second book is My Further Disillusionment in Russia. <laughs> She's one of the few that understands. The other one is a very gifted theoretician. That is Rosa Luxemburg, a Polish Jew from Zamosh. She also understands that Lenin has created an authoritarian, a dictatorial society. All right. So there's Pasternak, there's Solzhenitsyn. They are, in their own way, tearing down the Soviet Union. Two last books, and then we'll call it a day, and I'll ask if there are any questions. One is a book that appeared in 1968. In English, it is June 22, 1941. There isn't a person of a certain age that doesn't know where he was on June 22, of 1941 if you lived in the Soviet Union. 
That's the date that the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. That's the beginning of Operation Barbarossa. If you ever had the good fortune to talk to Shimon Pakta, a former ritual director, he will tell you what happened on June 22nd, 1941. You know how it all begins? The dividing line between Red Army and Wehrmacht, German Army forces, is the Bug River, B-U-G. That's the river in eastern Poland. The Russians are on the eastern side, the Germans are on the western side. They've partitioned Poland. 5.30 in the morning, a German officer with a loudspeaker asks to meet on the morning of June 22nd, 41. He wants to meet in the middle of the Bug with representatives of the Red Army. The Germans come out, the Russians come out. As soon as they meet, the Germans kill all the Russians. That's the beginning of Operation Barbarossa. I told you in passing that the Red Army went not from defeat to defeat, but from catastrophe to catastrophe. Why did this take place? Why did it take place? Now, the background here is, you know, I'm over 80, and I haven't met too many people, Russian people, Russians my age, that knew their mother and father, that knew their father. It was always the same story. My father was in the factory. My father was in the university. Father was here. My father was there. The danger was so great. The Germans were coming so fast. As I tell the students of you know, Union College, there's the library square out there. I try to put it into things that they would understand. If I were a young professor at Moscow State University, someone from the party would come in, in my class at 10 o'clock in the morning, and tell me and all of the male students, get to the library plaza at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We would be handed a rifle, given two hours of training, put on a truck, and thrown against the Germans. Slaughtered, absolutely slaughtered. Soviet losses in the Second World War are 27 million people. That's on a population base of less than 200 million. To put this in perspective, American losses in both theaters, the Pacific Theater and the Asian Theater, in four years of fighting, the total number of American dead on a population base of 130 million is 492,000. Do you understand what I'm telling you here? The war, again, on my first trip to the Soviet Union in 1969, I happened to attend, not attend, it was a day where weddings were taking place. And I saw, so you would never see this in the United States, never see it. Young Russian couples were, they were going to the cemeteries with flowers to putting on the graves of dead relatives from the war, dead soldiers, and actually thanking them for their sacrifices during the war. Memorial Day is a day for barbecues in our country, a day for double headers. It is not that way in the Soviet Union. It is not that way, and it's not that way in Russia either. So the question arose, why does all this happen? And the answer was, according to these authors, Nekrich and uh, another man, it's, also, it's Stalin's fault. Stalin did not prepare us for this, and he had information. The most effective spy of the 20th century is a German communist by the name of Richard Sorge, S-O-R-G-E. Sorge was a German communist, but the, the German intelligence never caught on to him. He worked for a newspaper, for a magazine in Leipzig. He sent on assignment, he sent on assignment to Tokyo, links up with the Japanese Communist Party cell, which had penetrated the embassy of the Third Reich, the German embassy. He learned about the German attack on the Soviet Union. He knew when it was coming, and he knew how it was coming and where it was coming. That information was transmitted to Soviet intelligence, and Stalin saw it and disregarded all of the information. Because I'm standing where I am, we know what Stalin wrote on the margins. Stalin could be very crude and used obscene language, and he used that obscene language talking about Richard Sorge. Stalin had information from a whole variety of sources about an impending German attack, disregarded all of that, thought that this was a provocation by American British intelligence to suck the Soviet Union into a war with Nazi Germany. He disregarded all of the information. And because of the purge, the best and the brightest were done. 
You want to hear a good example of chutzpah, a really good example? There was a Soviet general. I think, I know his name, I think this is the one I'm talking about. A man named Malinovsky, a good Soviet general. He was in the gulag. He was purged. He had no teeth. They knocked out his teeth in the gulag. But Zhukov, the great Soviet general, in the bad days of late 41 and 42, tells Stalin, we got some good people in the gulag. You got to get them out. They got to they run our armies. And Malinovsky's brought out. And he's brought to Stalin. No teeth in his mouth. And Stalin, here's the ultimate chutzpah. Comrade Malinovsky, where were you? Stalin had signed the order to put him there in the first place. Where were you, Comrade? Now we need you. Where were you? Why do you look like that? Malinovsky is brought out, and Malofsky, Malinovsky becomes the leading Red Army generals in the Second World War. Stalin counterattacked all the time, before the time was ready. Hundreds of thousands, if not several million Soviet soldiers were killed because Stalin had made terrible mistakes during the war. That's going to discredit the Soviet system. And finally, a book appears in 1969. Will the Soviet Union survive 1984? By Andrei Amalric. And what he writes there is, we're not. The Soviet Union is going to be doomed by 1984. The system isn't working well, and the Chinese are going to nuke us to death. Now, what I'm trying to tell you here is, before I answer any question, what I'm trying to tell you here is, ideas count in history, and so do personalities. These, these ideas are going to undermine the Soviet system. What's a good example? I'll talk to you about another lecture. What's the book that changes the way Americans look at slavery at that time? It's Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? And I'll get into another discussion with you. What's the book in your time, in our time, that changed the way people looked at slavery? It's the miniseries Roots. There are things that are discussed there that we never heard about in high school or college history classes. Ideas are important. Personality is important in history. These men have have to be acknowledged as being the grave diggers of the Soviet Union. It is a tragedy that in the Soviet Union, in the imploded Soviet Union, in Russia, going back a thousand years in history, there are only two times in all of Russian history that there was anything approaching, approaching democracy. One is February 1917 to October 1917. That's the time of the provisional government. October 1917, Lenin comes to power. And then it's done. And after the Soviet Union implodes, 1991 to January 1st, 2000. That's the time of Boris Yeltsin. This is a personal tragedy in terms of Yeltsin. Sometimes in history and in politics, men finally come into their own. They are ready to do the things that are so important but they're sick as dogs. Yeltsin was a sick man, an alcoholic, with all of the diseases that are associated with alcoholism. So bad off was he that he was caught wandering the streets of Washington, D.C., semi-nude, and had to be brought back to the Soviet embassy. That's the tragedy. Here is a man that did institute democracy, not the on floor, not the democracy with flaws. Personality counts in history. Ideas count in history. That's what we're going to talk about next week in the context of American history. Now, my friends, the floor is yours. I know it's getting late. I will not spin out any answers. I'll give you a right. I'll give you the emiss, the truth as I know it. Are there any questions? Or am I in such a lucky day that in my 56 years of teaching and lecturing, I have kindly, finally come across an audience that knows it all. <laughs> Color of vote. Oh, I will repeat any question, if there are some questions. Yes. I'm sorry. We'll get to all of them, and I'll go for quite fast. Yes.
Of course they are. He's asking, given what Solzhenitsyn did, and he's not the only one, I mentioned some others, but then there are others beyond that, who are the grave diggers putting nails in the coffin of the Soviet Union. Yeah. But make no mistake, Putin is not Stalin. You don't want to cross Putin, for sure. You don't. And he's created a, an authoritarian society. But we are not talking about mass murder. And he is aggressive. In fact, he's gone a step too far. Stalin knew his limits. Putin doesn't seem to know his limits. But yes, it is a terrible disappointment for many, many people who live in the Soviet Union that after all that they had suffered, and after, again, the Soviet Union, again, imploded, and there was democracy for nine years, that this is what we have. Yes, it is a terrible tragedy. Yes? If I understand the, correction, the question correctly, there are people who are around Putin who believe that the policy is the wrong one and why don't they do anything? Come, come. You cross Putin. See, I can't use the expression that I use to the students. You're dead. You're dead meat. You just don't do that. But I will tell you, since you raised that question, there is a red line that if the Ukraine crosses it, no one knows what the future is. That red line is Crimea, is the Crimea. Putin cannot survive in power. Then people will take him out. The generals will go against him. If the Ukrainians take the Crimea or can come close to using the Crimea, and I must tell you, don't get upset what I'm telling you, the Russian claim on the Crimea is better than the Ukrainian claim. The Ukrainians only got the Crimea because in 1954, Khrushchev unilaterally gave the Crimea to the Ukraine. When the Soviet Union was in place, it didn't make any difference. Crimea was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, as it was part of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. But the Crimea has historically been part of Russia. And some of the heroic days, if you read anything by Tolstoy, his short stories about fighting in the Crimea during the Crimean War, the heroic defense of, of Sevastopol during the Second World War. He cannot lose the Crimea. And that's why, if you want to get scared, this is a man that might use a tactical nuclear weapon. Don't walk out of here saying that Professor Burke said he's going to use a tactical nuclear weapon. I'm not saying that. I'm a historian. I'm lucky if I get the history right. I'm not a prophet. But I will tell you, for him to lose the Crimea, that's the end of Putin. Yes, Natalie. I remember when you were brief smuggling Jewish books into Russia. When did they change from the anti-anti-Semitism to the anti-Semitic? Now, what do you mean that she's saying about the anti-anti-Semitism? When did you see anti-anti-Semitism? Oh, that's in the 1920s. Yeah, it's with Stalin. That changes. Stalin believed that the Jews, I'll use a term, more history than you ever want to know. Nobody uses the term anymore. Stalin believed that Soviet Jews were fifth column, a subversive element in Soviet society. That term, fifth column, comes from the Spanish Civil War, when a correspondent wrote that Madrid is under attack from two columns in the east, two columns in the west, and from a fifth column inside the city of Madrid. It, always, it is synonymous with meaning a subversive element from within. Why does he look upon this? Well, why do people become anti-Semites? That's for the psychiatrist, not for the historian or the political scientist. But the problem is going to be, remember, we're in the period of the Cold War, even before the Cold War. The Soviet Jews, were the only, with the exception of another group that always came under suspicion, the Germans along the Volga River. They were the only two groups of people that had more of co-religionists or compatriots 
living outside of the Soviet Union than inside of the Soviet Union. Comes the Cold War. Stalin worries about the Jews in the Soviet Union. You want to see how bad it gets? This I've told some of you before. 1948. 1948. The Soviet Union had supported Jewish Palestine. Had support, actually supported Zionism. Outside of the Soviet Union, not inside. There's a big dinner. Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister. He holds a dinner for the first Israeli ambassador, Golda Meirson, as she was called, Golda Meir. She comes in Moscow. Big dinner, big, big dinner. And to everybody's surprise, Mrs. Molotov walks over to Golda and says in Yiddish, Ich bin ein Yiddish Tochter. I'm a daughter of the Jewish people. She will be arrested and will spend from 1948 and 1953 in the Gulag until Stalin dies. Her husband will remain the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. It is, it's another world that we're talking about, another world. It's chutzpedik of me to tell people here who are from the Soviet Union that it's another world. All I can tell you is uh, there was a story about a Russian Jewish woman who landed at the Kennedy Airport in 1973. And she comes out and representatives of the Jewish Federation, the New York Jewish community, come to her with flowers, traditional greeting. And she says to them, she says, you American Jews, you think we come from a different country. You think we come from a different continent. You're wrong. We come from a different planet. <laughs> and she's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Another Russian woman comes and says about her experience. She was a high school history teacher. High school history teacher. She lost her job because in a high school history class, she mentioned they were talking about the great French Revolution. The Russian word for great is Veliki. You don't use the word Veliki in terms of revolution unless you're talking about the great October Revolution. She lost her job because she used great for the French Revolution. It's a different world out there, which leads to the question, a very interesting question is, we're not racists here. Is there, is there a gene on chromosome 16 that codes for repression in everyone who's born in the Soviet Union? I don't think so. Is it? Why is it happening? Why is there only those two periods of democracy? That's the, that's the thing that drives historians crazy. Is it because of the Mongols and the Mongol yoke? Is it because the Soviet Union, Russia, was in a perpetual state of siege? The Japanese from the West, the Swedes, the Poles, and the French and the Germans coming from the West? Is that what it was? When a country lives in a perpetual state of siege? Remember, the Poles take Moscow and actually install, in the early 17th century, a Polish Catholic Pope as Tsar. When the Mongols invade Russia in the 13th century, the initial impact is that 40% of the Russian population is killed. Is this what it is? That a country lives in a perpetual state of siege? It develops a centralized society in which everything is subjected to the state? I'm not going there. I'm just telling you. In a thousand years of Russian history, there are only two periods, and taken together, they come to about a year and a half of democracy. Anything else, my friends? Yes? Do you think that Prigozhin could have played his hand differently and actually overthrown? Or Do I think that Prigozhin, who was the leader of the Wagner, the Wagner group, would, would he have thund, could he have succeeded, and would he have changed Russia? You know? First of all, there wasn't a chance in the world that he would succeed. And I got to tell you, the surest bet in the world, better than betting on anything else, that he wasn't going to live long. That was money in the bank. So I can't answer that question. The question that people do answer, but we can't go into it here. Suppose in the struggle for power after Stalin's death, men like Bukharin and Trotsky had led the Soviet Union would things have turned out the same way? Can't answer that. 
That's hypothetical history. And we know from our own country's history, you know, I, I talked to the students also on that first day, how important accident and chance is in history. Late 1932, President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt is riding in a motorcade in Miami. An assassin steps out, fires at Roosevelt, misses and kills Mayor Cermak of Chicago, who's also in the parade. How much of American history would have been different had Roosevelt had been killed? His vice president was John Nance Garner from Texas, not a man noted for liberal ideas. Would we have had the New Deal? Would we have had that superb now, many of us as Jews have a problem with Roosevelt because of the issue of Jewish immigration in the 30s and early 40s. But give the man his credit. I know I'm talking to mature people. If you're collecting Social Security, you thank Franklin Delano Roosevelt. If, you're ba if your deposits in a savings bank are insured, that's Roosevelt. If you were unfortunate to raise a child by yourself or you were raised by a single parent, it's the Social Security safety net. If he's dead, who's going to do that? Again, do the times make the man? What, all of that, you know, you're all familiar with that. And look how much we have lost. Look how much we have lost with the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Probably the greatest American, one of the two, three greatest Americans of the 20th century. You know how much we have lost? You refugees from MSNBC? How disgraceful is it that a network like that gives a platform to Al Sharpton? Absolutely disgraceful. That's what passes in some ways for black leadership in our country. How much have we lost? And what about the Vietnam War? Suppose Bobby Kennedy was not assassinated. Suppose he became the president. Would we have stayed in Vietnam? I don't know. Accident and chance are very, very important. Anything else? Any other questions, my friends? Thank you very, very much. We'll see each other next week. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you all for coming. I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was a fabulous lecture. Stay tuned next week for another great evening. Thanks again for coming out.